Okay. Uh, this hearing of the Subcommittee on Government Organization Efficiency and Financial Management will come to order. Uh, before I make a brief uh, opening statement, do want to thank both my colleagues for juggling schedules uh, around the uh, floor schedule as well as our witness for juggling her schedule uh, to accommodate the uh, change in our starting time. Um, in, in 2003 and 2004, I was honored to work with um, then also ranking member Mr. Towns uh, to sponsor the Department of Homeland Security Financial Accountability Act. Uh, that law placed the Department under the CFO Act requiring a Senate-confirmed CFO and imposed the first ever statutory requirement for an audit of internal controls at a federal agency. When DHS was created in 2002, it inherited substantial financial management challenges, particularly from the Legacy Immigration Naturalization Service, which had been a component of the United States Department of Justice, as well as the United States Coast Guard, formerly under the Department of Transportation. Financial management at the Coast Guard was, uh, presented a unique challenge in that its books had never been subject to a financial audit. Recognizing the many challenges facing the Department, Ranking Member Towns and I wanted to address the root causes of financial management problems before they became ingrained in this new Department. Therefore, uh, the law that we passed focused on remediating internal control weaknesses by requiring a separate assertion and audit opinion of the Department's internal controls over financial reporting. While the Department certainly has made progress, we still have a long way to go. Um, DHS still does not have a clean audit opinion, and we are particularly concerned that the Department does not currently have a Senate-confirmed CFO. Uh, our witness here today, uh, Ms. Peggy Sherry, uh, is a career civil servant, and we certainly are grateful for your many years of service uh, to, um, to the Department, but to your fellow citizens, to our nation. Uh, Ms. Sherry is the acting CFO, and while we applaud her efforts, uh, we certainly look forward to the administration, along with the Secretary of the Department, working together uh, to get a Senate-confirmed CFO in place as intended and required uh, by the law. Um, I'm pleased by the progress that DHS has made to address specific weaknesses, and I agree with the Department's strategy of foregoing standalone audits at components in favor of directing staff resources to correcting pervasive material weaknesses. The Department made a decision this past Thursday to cancel its um, most recent procurement efforts regarding uh, a major financial management system, and I'm glad that we have this chance here today to uh, have um, some discussion about that action. Uh, Mr. Towns and I remember all too well the debate that surrounded uh, eMERGE II and the uh, efforts uh, in uh, 2003 and, and thereafter uh, that was abandoned after a substantial amount of money had already been spent. Uh, the successor to eMERGE II, uh, TASC, uh, was able to leverage some of that money, but there were certainly some sunk costs that were not uh, benefited to the American people. I understand the Department is taking a new approach, and we look forward to hearing how that change will focus uh, DHS and help it reach uh, its goal of good financial management. Uh, I will add that most of the material weaknesses still on the books are related to processes and not systems, and regardless of what decision DHS, DHS makes on how it will integrate its information systems, the underlying processes must be fixed, must be corrected for that system to function properly. Again, we're delighted to have Ms. Um, uh, Sherry with us as a witness, and uh, I will yield to the ranking member, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Towns, for the purpose of an opening statement. Thank you very much. Um, uh, let me thank the chairman of the uh, full committee, who's also here, and of course, the chairman of the uh, uh, subcommittee, my good friend uh, uh, Connolly from um, the great state of Virginia. Uh, the DHS Financial Accountability Act which you and I co-sponsored, as you indicated, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, is one of the most important pieces of legislation that affects an issue that we are both committed to, proper financial management within the United States government. This hearing will provide us with up-to-date information on how DHS is managing its finances, and I thank you for holding this hearing. Ms. Sherry, as the acting chief financial officer at DHS, everyone in your agency reports to you how well financial account accountability is proceeding. I welcome you, and I am anxious and eager to hear your testimony. 
The Department of Homeland Security has an extremely important mission to ensure a, home, a homeland that is safe, secure, and resilient against terrorism and other hazards. That mission protects each and every one of us, and we must provide the necessary support in order for it to be carried out. The GAO and DHS Inspector General have been keeping your financial management system under constant scrutiny. It is encouraging to see that the Department has made some improvements in internal controls over the years. Material weaknesses are down from 18 to 6 across the Department. Improper payments have been decreased from nearly $929,000 down to $38,000. That is real improvement. That is truly great work. However, there is still room for improvement. It is absolutely critical that DHS establish an integrated financial system. It is nearly impossible to achieve an unqualified audit opinion without one. DHS has been on the GAO's high risk list since its creation. You have to work on not becoming a permanent resident of that list. I see from the testimony that your office is working very closely with the Coast Guard to improve internal controls. I would like to hear more about those efforts and the work being done with the other DHS components. I want to thank you for being here today, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you and as to how we might be able to improve financial management but also to say to you that we are here to also help. If there are some things that we need to do, we feel let us know. And uh, we want to work together because we feel this is very, very important. On that note, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank the gentleman. Uh, we will now move to uh, our uh, witnesses' opening statement. We are delayed to have uh, uh, Peggy Sherry here, um, acting CFO of the Department. Uh, and uh, Deputy Chief Financial Officer, uh, if we get a, a, a Senate-confirmed CFO. Uh, Ms. Sherry has um, been with the um, Department since 19, I'm sorry, from 2007 uh, as Director of Financial Management. Uh, she's responsible for developing the Department-wide financial management policy, preparing Department-wide financial reports, and leading the Department's financial audits. And prior to joining DHS, uh, Ms. Sherry was Deputy Chief Financial Officer for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and an auditor with GAO for more than nine years, overseeing numerous financial audits. And certainly appreciate your work at GAO, and as one who has great regard for the work of GAO and uh, uh, its important uh, partnership with members of Congress, and uh, as we oversee uh, the operation of the, f of the federal government. But again, we're delighted to have you here, and uh, look forward to your testimony. And um, practice of uh, of the committee is to swear in all of our witnesses. So if I could ask you to stand and raise your right right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, let the record reflect that the witnesses have affirmed the oath, and uh, we will proceed to your statement. Um, I think the clock said it is seven minutes. If you need to go over, you are it. Uh, so uh, if you need uh, additional time, uh, that is uh, not a problem, and then we will go to questions. So, Mr. Chairman. Oh, yes. Uh, I just want to say, uh, uh, in your introduction of our witness today, one of the most singular and important facets of her life is that she is a constituent of the 11th District of Virginia. <laughs> and we are proud to have her here. And, and uh, I am delighted to be there. <laughs> to, to the gentleman from Virginia, I uh, sincerely apologize, not realizing that I would have had you do the introduction, Mr. <laughs> Connolly. And I, I apologize. Uh, I would have objected. <laughs> 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 but we, uh, we are delayed to have you, and especially as a constituent of uh, the gentleman from Virginia, uh, and uh, we will uh, allow you to proceed. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it very much. And thank you, Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns, and members of the committee for the opportunity to provide an update on the Department of Homeland Security's progress in implementing the Financial Accountability Act of 2004 and the financial management improvements we have achieved since 2009. The Accountability Act gave our Department the foundation it needed to successfully structure and improve financial management and corrective action planning for DHS through internal controls over financial reporting, accountability reports, and audit opinions. 
DHS began improvements to our financial management structure in fiscal year 2005, and since that time, we have continued to show significant improvements in our annual financial report and audits. DHS now has only six material weaknesses and has isolated the issues on the balance sheet to one component. I continue to work with Secretary Napolitano, Deputy Secretary Lute, and our component CFOs to build on our significant progress. Our approach to improving internal controls over financial reporting focuses on identifying root causes, executing corrective actions, setting achievable milestones, and providing strong oversight to strengthen department-wide internal controls and to significantly improve key financial areas. I am pleased to report that by using this strategy in fiscal year 2010, improvements made by the United States Coast Guard and other components increased the Department's auditable balance sheet to approximately 90 percent. After achieving several successful standalone audit opinions, the Department is focused on receiving a full scope audit opinion, and my staff and I are working diligently toward this target. In fiscal year 2010, Secretary Napolitano committed to the goal of receiving a qualified audit opinion on the DHS consolidated balance sheet this fiscal year. Once we achieve this audit result, we are well positioned to expand the audit scope to include the other statements as is required by law. In order to receive an opinion on our consolidated balance sheet in fiscal year 2011, specific improvements and corrective actions must be made at the United States Coast Guard. Admiral Papp, the Commandant of the Coast Guard, issued an all-hands directive memo to his staff, both civilian as well as military, this past January, that stressed the importance of corrections required to achieve success with the audit in fiscal year 2011. My staff meets regularly with the Coast Guard to monitor their financial strategy for audit readiness, also known as their F-STAR plan. I also meet frequently with the Coast Guard leadership, staff, and our auditors to discuss progress. Coast Guard is demonstrating controls over current year activity, they are verifying the accuracy of accounting data, and they are analyzing the financial impact of their legacy systems. By executing corrective action plans and monitoring risks throughout the year, the United States Coast Guard is putting the Department on a path to attaining a balance sheet opinion in fiscal year 2011. However, because of the deficiencies in their current financial system, the Coast Guard is still unable to fully remediate all of its financial management issues. Many DHS systems are not modernized and have system functionality as well as security weaknesses. In addition to functionality issues, most legacy systems do not comply with the Federal financial management system requirements, accounting standards, and the United States general ledger at the transaction level. DHS is analyzing alternative strategies to meet the Department's requirements based on recent Federal information technology policy changes and various advances in IT and security. DHS only requires system modernizations where there are currently severe deficiencies in system security and functionality. We are focusing our most critical, on our most critical needs first and will approach correcting those needs in small, manageable segments. While the audit is a critical tool to measure our progress as a department from year to year, we are committed to expanding our success beyond the elements in the annual financial statement audit. The Accountability Act rightly highlights the importance of internal controls over financial reporting and implementing planning, programming, and budgeting for the Department. We strongly agree with those tenants and have established processes and controls to comply with government-wide initiatives like the Improper Payments Reduction Act and Open Government, as well as audit re recommendations from both the OIG and the GAO. I am pleased to report that DHS was found fully compliant with the Improper Payments Information Act since 2009. We are committed to being strong stewards of the taxpayer dollars, and we have worked closely with OMB to make sure DHS was prepared to implement new improper payment reporting requirements. 
Today, all DHS components assess each of their programs for risk using standard guidance provided by my office, and programs potentially at high risk for improper payments are tested based on these assessments. Since implementing these controls in fiscal year 2008, DHS has significantly lowered estimated improper error rates at FEMA on average from about 9 percent to 2 percent. Improper payment amounts identified by recovery auditors have also dropped from about $929,000 in 2008 to just $38,000 in fiscal year 2010, even though the amount of data provided for recovery auditors to review has increased significantly from year to year. The Accountability Act also focuses on the need to report internal controls over financial reporting. This set the foundation for DHS to develop a financial management strategic plan each year. My office just published the Department's fifth annual internal controls playbook that establishes mission action plans and focuses on our most significant internal control findings. The playbook also supports moving our focus beyond internal controls over financial reporting and expanding improvements to internal controls over operations by, by using government charge cards and risk management initiatives to reduce the risk of waste, fraud, and abuse. Based on risk areas in the playbook, my office has established a bank card assessment team that meets weekly to implement corrective actions to strengthen the Department's internal controls in the bank card program. The Department also continues to refine and update the Financial Management Policy Manual. This provides all DHS employees with standard processes to follow for budgetary policy, financial reporting, and bank card management. A recent update to the Financial Management Policy Manual is the addition of our Financial Assistance Awards and Oversight section, which contains 11 new policies to streamline and standardize grants management at DHS. The Policy Manual puts management control systems in place to efficiently achieve the DHS mission. In compliance with the Accountability Act, our Program Analysis and Evaluation Division works with a formal planning, programming, budgeting, and execution system to guide the development of a five-year budget and performance plan. These efforts produce the annual budget request and the future year Homeland Security Program report, another tenant outlined in the FAA. Clearly, the Accountability Act has provided DHS with a foundation for strong financial management and internal controls. However, to carry out this important legislation, we must rely on our most valuable resource at DHS, our people. At DHS, there are over 2,500 financial management professionals across the Department. In order to hire and retain the most qualified workforce, I sponsor various departmental and training programs within my office. I support a rotational fellows program provide new hire training for the department-wide CFO employees. I host an annual CFO conference attended by over 300 DHS financial managers. We offer resource training programs for all program analysis and evaluation staff, and we offer an appropriations law training course for all department-wide CFO employees. Providing training, and, uh, training opportunities and supporting career development not only better equips our staff to perform their jobs, but also helps us to retain our staff. Using the objectives outlined in the Accountability Act, we continue to make significant progress toward improving financial management at DHS. And I am very fortunate to work with such a dedicated staff and have the support of our senior leadership as we continue these efforts. I appreciate the support we have received from this committee and Congress, and I look forward to working with you in the future, and I am happy to take any of the questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sherry. Uh, again, we appreciate both the writ testimony and your, your oral testimony here today um, and, um, and your dedicated efforts uh, at DHS in, in um, uh, trying to help rein in uh, a challenging assignment. Um, I want to start first with kind of a, a premise that when we did the accountability legislation uh, several years back and the issue of the importance of the CFO position. As I mentioned in my opening statement, we're anxious for us to get back to a Senate-confirmed uh, appointee. Again, not in any way uh, a, a reflection on our lack of 
faith and trust in you, but is sending that message of the importance of the CFO role. Um, can you give us um, any idea of where uh, we stand with the Secretary, with the Administration on you know, that, that process and, and uh, what, what we can expect uh, here in the near future? Thank you, Congressman. Um, uh, the, uh, first, I will say that um, I think in the position that I have been in and having the, had the opportunity to serve as acting as well as the Deputy CFO, um, I have enjoyed um, very strong support from DHS leadership, both the Secretary as well as Deputy Secretary Lute um, and Under Secretary Rafael Boris have provided very, very good support to my office, so I will say that. Um, having said that, though, um, your, your question is a, is a very good one, and what I would have to do is, is to di direct you to the White House at this particular point as they are really in charge of, of um, Senate confirmed political positions. So, so there has been no um, discussions with you or the Secretary uh, from uh, personnel at the White House about um, a, a time frame or uh, you know where where things currently stand? No, no, sir, not directly with me. The um, the as far as where things actually stand, I, I do know that it is clearly an important is an important initiative for the secretary as well as well as for the White House. Yeah, we we hope that uh, the secretary and the White House do take it seriously because um, bottom line, it's it's the law, and and we uh, put it in law. Uh, Mr. Towns and I, uh, with our colleagues in the House and Senate and the former president, uh, because of the importance of, of uh, emphasizing this position. As you are um, in your role as, as acting CFO and um, uh, deputy CFO, um, how would you describe your access to the secretary? Is it a direct communication? Uh, if you have an issue, you um, can go right to the secretary, or do you need to go to the deputy secretary or undersecretary? No, I, I do have direct access. In fact, um, stressing the importance of getting the, the Coast Guard to get a clean opinion, um, I had the um, opportunity to talk directly with the secretary and to emphasize to her the support, um, how important it was for us to be able to, uh, you know, reach out to the Coast Guard and to you know kind of set that goal and um, and you know she went right out on record and said that we're even though it is a high risk prospect still for us to be able to get a qualified opinion in 2011 just because as you, as you all have indicated it is a, it is a complex agency and there was a lot of work that needed to get done and still needs to get done at the Coast Guard um, she absolutely went out and and provided in writing as well as sent a memo at the beginning of this calendar year to remind everyone that no one's letting up it's not just the Coast Guard, but all of the other improvements that we have done throughout the Department, all components were, were responsible for working towards this qualified opinion this year. So absolutely, the ability to be able to go and, and talk about Great. basic financial management um, you know, needs, in addition to um, many, many meetings with her on the overall budget itself, is you know, very critically important to the Secretary. Uh, I am very pleased to hear that, and a testament to you and the Secretary to, to have and maintain that relationship and that open communication. And in fact, you are uh, being here to testify as the acting CFO. Um, you know, um, we are appreciative of that commitment as well by your presence here today. Um, on the issue of the, um, of the decision to um, forego moving forward with the task um, program and uh, to kind of start again with uh, a um, department wide financial management system, uh, a couple of questions. Um, the, the Last effort with eMERGE 2, we had spent about $9 million before a decision that it just wasn't going to work. Uh, we got some benefit, I think, from the, those costs as we moved to the, the new effort um, with uh, a decision to kind of start over. Can you give us a ballpark of, of what have taxpayers spent that um, is maybe not totally lost, uh, but not getting the result that our hope was when we, uh, when we started uh, over the second time. Sir, are you are referring specifically with TAS? Yes. The TAS program, yeah. yes. So we received, I, I'm happy to do that. We received um, so far in total, what, what we actually had is some carryover from even from the eMERGE program, where we, with the Department was not spending that, but we were allowed to keep that as carryover. So in addition to the, the funding that we have been fortunate to have received in fiscal year 9, 10, and, and then a little bit in 11, in total we had about $47 million. Mm. Um, 
of the $47 million, we have obligated about $4.8 million. All right? And when I say obligated, what, what we did is, is we initially went to award in November of 2010. Um, we issued our first task order for, on, against the contract in late February of 2011. Um, and that, that was to stand up the program management office, the contract program management office, which would complement my <laughs> office, my program management office, which was really a blending of components as well as the different disciplines with you know, but they were Federal employees. Um, Ten days after the the task order was um, was issued, we, we protest this in exactly. Right. So so what we, what we have obligated has really been the three point five as it related to the task order, as well as a, um, one point eight million dollars as it related to programs program support within my office. And and since we had to stop work, I really don't have any invoices against that. But that kind of gives you the magnitude of we've ten days worth of the contract. So yeah. um, but what we did get for that was um, an integrated master schedule, a draft integrated master schedule, because we really had just gotten out of the gate on this. Okay, so We had an integrated master schedule as well as an earned value management, uh, a draft plan for that, as well as a, a, a draft training plan as well. So, um, it, it, but, but what it doesn't speak to is the value that we have also gotten from this, this, this time around was really as it relates to the data cleanup efforts, the things that the Department has been doing, preparing in order to be able to get to the contract. And that would be require working with the components have the most critical business need, really looking at the data cleanup initiative. So uh, if I understand in numbers, um, 9 million that was spent eMERGE to, uh, and then a different direction, and, and we have spent somewhere in the 3 and a half million or you we, you obligated not, but we have just obligated it. But and, and have not gotten invoices, that, so you don't that's, know that's, what. That is exactly right. That's so. Exactly um, right. So uh, of, uh, of the 40 plus million that was kind of set aside for this, the overwhelming bulk of that has not been spent. Yes, sir, that is correct. Right. That is correct. And, and any of the federal t energies that we have spent where it was as part of my base budget itself has been, has been preparing for the data cleanup and the change management, any of the things that I am going to be able to use anyway. Well, and that, okay, that, that was my thought. So what you have done internally is you are not going to lose that. A absolutely not. All it has done is set the Department that much closer to being able to really manage, manage this really well. So it, okay. none of that has been lost. Okay. I have got some follow-ups on that, but I, I uh, want to yield to, uh, to the ranking member first, and we will come back around. So I yield to the gentleman from New York. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Ms. Sherry, you mentioned that the most valuable resource DHS has is its people. And I want you to know I agree with you wholeheartedly um, uh, on that. Um, GAO reported in December 2009 that DHS hired staff in anticipation of implementing the task uh, system. My question to you is, now that you scrapped it, what happened to these staff people? They are still part of my base annual budget, so I still have them. And what we have been working on, even before we went to award, what we have been working on is working with the components that have that critical business need that still need to get their accounting systems replaced all right, or modernized, um, working with them to be able to get their data cleaned up. Because what you, what you can't do is have um, data that is not really ready to move to the new system. If it is not cleaned up or if, you don't, if your balances aren't good, then there is no sense moving garbage into the new system. So we have worked with uh, the components to be able to clean up their data. We have worked on developing uh, change management plans, because so much of one of these uh, uh, fi financial systems modernizations really centers around change management, changing people the way people do their things or do, do their business, also focused around um, the, the business process, standardization of business process. So what we have been doing, sir, is really setting the foundation, getting the Federal Government ready for, for the contract, is what we have been doing with my Federal state. Staff. Right. You know, I think this points out, you know, in terms of the, the statement that the chairman raised early on is that, you know, um, the confirmation part, because, you know, when you have to scrap a program and then you move and then you scrap another one, and of course, uh, you know, I think that, you know, um, the consistency is just so important in terms of, uh, and that's the reason why I think that, um, you know, we really need to push in, uh, for this confirmation, because I think that, um, uh, 
that needs to be done. But anyway, um, let me just move along to another uh, question. Um, in your opinion, what is the worst case scenario for DHS if they fail to integrate discipline processes that GAO recommends before a new financial management system contract is awarded? What an what a, what a integrated financial system really brings to um, the value that it really brings to the Department is really sustainability. It, it, it introduces effectiveness and efficiency. And, and what we have at this particular point in the Department, not throughout the Department, because some of our, some of our components do have modernized systems and, and they are in good shape. But some of the components, about 75 percent of my overall resources, they are on systems, these agencies, these components are on systems that are either they're, they're legacy, they're not, they're, um, they're, they're not, um, they're proprietary. They're not necessarily supported anymore. In many instances, they're not integrated with an acquisition system or with the asset system. And as a result, what that means is I can't have strong internal controls. I can't, you know, it's not just up to the system to have good internal controls, but the sustainability is really critical in order to be able to have these integrated systems. In addition, it allows you to be much more efficient in the work that you do. Um, I think that from a standpoint of where do you actually have your people working, if they're, if they're doing manual processes where they're having to do manual reconciliations in order to be able to make sure the contracts that are recorded in your procurement system actually marry up with what you're actually reporting in your core financial system, having to do those manual reconciliation processes not only is not overly efficient or effective, I could be using them maybe to do heavy the analytics, you know, especially as we need in, in, in these current fiscal times. Um, but what it also does is introduce internal control risk, the ability to be able to have something obligated in your contract system if for whatever reason it doesn't make its way into your general ledger system, there is the potential to have some severe funds control, internal control weaknesses. Right. Thank you very much. And let me just say to Mr. Chairman before I yield back that maybe what we need to do is to send a letter indicating the fact that, um, you know, uh, this is the law and that, you know, we hope that they would move forward with confirmation and just sort of send it from the, the committee. And I think maybe to let them know that, you know, I really view this as being very serious. And I think that we should try to state it. And I yield back on that note. Uh, thank the gentleman and, and certainly share that perspective. And uh, we're glad to partner with you in, in uh, urging the, the White House to move as quickly, and, and, and maybe that will be the first step, and then we will urge our Senate colleagues to move quickly, too. Uh, that sometimes is one of the problems with confirmation. So uh, yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. And again, welcome, Ms. Sherry. Um, USCIS, FLATC, ICE have only one remaining material weakness each, while the Coast Guard still has six. What are some of the factors, in your view, that explain the differences in internal controls among the different components that we have such a variance? The, um, the, 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 the um, remaining material weaknesses at the, uh, at the Department level, which is the, really the six, which is really comprised of the various conditions throughout the various components. Um, really can only be corrected by, um, by having strong in the, the tenants, basically, that come from the Accountability Act. What you need to be able to do is to identify what is the root cause of the material weakness or the significant deficiency. Um, you need to be able to, so rather than just responding to potentially an auditor's finding where, where, where they identify an issue, if you, if you just respond to that issue without really identifying what was the root cause, what was the reason for actually having that material weakness, um, you're, what's going to end up happening is, is you'll continue to do work, but what you won't do is actually correct the internal control findings. And so um, by using the internal control playbook, which is really our annual strategic plan for how to correct our internal control weaknesses, we were able to work with the components, in particular my department, through the A123 process to work with them to be able to look at how their internal controls were designed and whether or not they were designed effectively, and to look at through the performance audits that we did also as a result of the Accountability Act to find out how well we were doing as far as developing corrective action plans. So the idea that you could develop a plan that may not be responsive to the problem was, is, not, is not going to ultimately end up reducing your, your material weakness. What 
we have done with the Coast Guard and what the other components were able to do before that is to kind of crack that code, all right, working with us. They were able to identify, and I think the magnitude of some of their issues were clearly a lot smaller than the Coast Guard as well. Um, but what we have done with the Coast Guard, working with them over the last couple years, and it is it's detailed in what they call their F-STAR, that is their audit remediation plan or their audit readiness plan. Um, what we have been able to do is to work with them to have them understand how to do that root cause analysis. So rather than just responding to an audit finding, they are now able to actually dig into what is the system issue, what is the process issue, what is the people issue, you know, how does it actually re relate to the remediation on the financial statements as well as the internal controls. Um, are there incentives within DHS uh, to make sure that various components of DHS take material weaknesses seriously and understand we got to have an unqualified audit? Yes, yes, sir, there are. In fact, um, what we do is the, the uh, Department Office of CFO, what we do is we meet with each of the component CFOs at least annually on, a, on an off-site retreat where what we do is we jointly establish what our, our goals and objectives are for the year um, as well as for, for the foreseeable future. Um, and then what I am able to do is I take those goals that we all agree on and it, the, getting the, quali the, uh, the clean opinion and correcting the material weaknesses as well as things that are at the, at the less significant level of a material weakness, we then put place them in the CFO's plans, performance plans, annual performance plans as, as, a, as an objective that they must meet. And then what we do is we meet with them periodically and then again at the year just to basically assess where they are at. I then, then report that up to the secretary and to the deputy secretary. So what you have is really, again, is what the, the, the GIPRA Act really wants us to be able to do is to de put that performance, you know, de decide what you are at, the outcome that you are trying to achieve is, and then put those goals into, or those, um, you know, into the various plans, and then that is what we do, sir, to be able to get them to understand the importance. Given the progress that has been made, obviously people do take it seriously, so, and, and I think it is a testament to your effectiveness as well, Ms. Sherry. Thank you, sir. Um, going back to the task order, and I am going to be running out of my, uh, time real fast here, but uh, which breaks up the, 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 the contract into smaller component parts. Is there an opportunity here, though, for DHS, for especially acquisition personnel, uh, to gain better uh, contract management skills and technical expertise as we do that? So more people have a chance to participate and develop the requisite skills? Because Chairman Platt and I are, are both very concerned, and I know Mr. Towns is as well, about the whole issue of acquisition training in the Federal Government. So in, in, the, in the loss here of, uh, of the reversal of the contract, is there also, however, perhaps an opportunity? There is great opportunity. Yes, there is great opportunity to do that. In fact, the Under Secretary for Management and the Deputy Secretary, as well as the Secretary, are very interested in making sure that we start to get this right. And I think that we have made some really good improvements, um, as, as um, demonstrated by the, the integrated plan that we have um, for g addressing the GAO high risk issue as it relates to transforming management, not just financial management, but as it relates to uh, transforming management within the Department. Um, the, the other thing that we have done really well as it relates to this particular acquisition is to start to bring, to, you know, start to have some of that not only horizontal integration, but also the vertical integration. Uh, one of the things that we are trying to do in the Department is to really um, in invigorate the overall governance process. So what we should be doing is we should be looking at these major acquisitions on a more real-time basis, but we should also be bringing all the right stakeholders and decision makers to the table to really review these. And what we had with TASC was what is called the Executive Steering Committee, which was made Made up, it was actually chaired, but it's chaired by the Under Secretary for Management. Has all the lines of business chiefs on it, under you know, um, within the within the uh, d the department. And then we also have as members on there members from the various components. So you would have your CIO, you have your CPO, you have your CFO, um, various components that actually participate on this steering committee. So that, sir, also I think is a really good way for us to be able to get our hands around a acquisition management throughout the department. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman and uh, would uh, just make a note that I, I know uh, the gentleman from Virginia is uh, working on some uh, legislation uh, to try to better train our um, acquisition personnel across the uh, Federal Government and uh, look forward to working with him as, uh, as we seek to advance that objective. 
I think, um, my friend. Would, would, uh, can I say, uh, if uh, we're going to do another round of questions, if uh, give you a chance to kind of catch your breath and settle in. Um, I, I'm going to follow up uh, on the task, uh, the, the recent announcement. Um, it's my understanding that, uh, that DHS is, is no longer requiring that um, it be housed in the enterprise data center uh, and that it not necessarily is going to be a single contract vehicle for the financial management system. Um, does this mean that we're going to have permanently some legacy systems that are kind of on their own, or uh, is it just in the, in the immediate term? But eventually the goal is still to have all systems kind of be, be united in one department-wide system. Um, I, I think we'll have to look at that as as we go forward. Um, you know, as we analyze the various strategies. But what our real where our real requirement is at this particular point is to modernize those systems that are in critical need to be able to do that, and and that speaks to over seventy percent of the budgetary resources components of, that need those modernized systems are you know well over half the department as it is anyway. So what we really want to do, based on um, you know the uh, the changes in um, IT policy governance and just the way that we look at financial the systems modernizations, um, in addition to the, um, the, the grave fiscal environment that we are currently in as well, it really makes sense for us to focus in on our critical business needs and those systems that need to be modernized. So, so I think as we lay out our overall strategy, um, we, will, we will consider how we will include those, those components that already have modernized systems. But really it is focusing on those critical business needs now and being able to implement this in small, manageable segments. And, and because of where the Coast Guard is, that's going to be heavily focused on the Coast Guard. And yes, sir. The, the, the Coast Guard clearly needs to have uh, changes to their, to their system. It needs to modernize their system. Um, th that probably is the, the main component that really I will struggle with in order to be able to get a full, a full scope audit done. So I am going to be able to get my qualified opinion on the balance sheet without the system, without us you know, mo modernizing their current system. I would not be able to do that for the full scope audit with the Coast Guard. In addition, in, in addition you have FEMA that, that also has functionality as well as system security issues that must be addressed as also a critical business need. And then ICE, the, um, with its, which, which is the accounting service provider for five other uh, DHS components, also is identified as having system security and functionality issues. So we will focus in on those, those critical business needs first. And, and uh, you may, maybe that addresses my, my question and I was going to ask specifics because in your testimony you talk about the uh, Department's fifth annual internal controls sure. uh, playbook and, and identifying uh, some plans and uh, milestones, areas of focus. Um, and you reference in there the Department's most significant internal control challenges. Uh, is that coming back to really what you just walked through with FEMA, with Coast Guard? The, the, absolutely. The, the, the being not compliant with the FFMIA and with A127, basically the good, the good tenants to be able to say how you should be able to have good, good data quality. You should be able to have complete data. You should be able to have timely data to be able to provide to all your stakeholders as well as to the, to the key decision makers of the Department. A $57 billion agency, you know, and, and we have some serious internal control issues and especially, uh, you know, the, the, the modernizing our systems would really be able to move us forward in that area. Well, and that, that's what, uh, as a committee, um, Mr. Towns and I, in working together in the past and again now, is really getting the systems in place where it is uh, day in and day out access to Absolutely. that information uh, as opposed to that manual you know, edits that are being done to rectify problems, uh, but that it's a, you know, Tomorrow, if you need information, you, you, know, you can go to the system, pull it up, and then make informed decisions. Absolutely. So um, that, that commitment that you have made to that effort is, is uh, one that we strongly support. And, and it um, goes, uh, you've talked about the con uh, component CFOs, and you're working with them, and your quarterly uh, meetings, and, and, and how you try to kind of keep everyone on the same page. Um, how is the, uh, I'll say, the chain of command or line of authority from you to the component CFOs? Uh, do they answer directly to you or uh, to um, uh, their agency head and then to you? 
they answer directly to their agency head, but there is the dotted line to the, to the Department's CFO. So, uh, as I said, I'm, I have the ability to be able to reach into their performance plans. In order to be able to hire um, into those positions, the Department will weigh in. We also weigh in on very critical other hires, such as your budget director or potentially a PA&E director. That was my specific follow-up. That hiring aspect. Yes. So you you don't have final say, but you can express uh, an opinion on who's in these positions. We, we, we absolutely can, and I'll, and I will tell you, I, I don't know that we've ever gone to the to the to the limit to be able to say if I have the final say or not. Um, we've always been able to work. They've always been able to work very cooperatively to, and, and they do look to us to be able to provide that input as well. I, I ask that um, um, another agency that we've worked with uh, in detail, with NASA, right. and one of the challenges we found there was you're the one that's responsible for the department wide audit and consolidated your, your financial statement, um, yet in NASA the, the, the center CFOs were not very responsive to the agency CFO. Um, doesn't sound like that's uh, an issue we're, here. We're very fortunate. What we also do is we, I meet with them more regularly than just quarterly. I also meet with them monthly. On, we have CFO council meetings where we, right. it's, it's the entire world that we work with, you know, budget as well as program analysis as well as internal controls. And um, what, um, what we also do is we meet with them much more regularly on as it relates to um, the critical internal control issues. So, for instance, I will meet with them as well as their senior staff on a monthly basis to, during during the time once we come out with our ICFR playbook, we then once they've they've signed on to coming up with a corrective action plan and what's the ultimate outcome that they're trying <coughs> to achieve is they actually have to come in and work with me on a monthly basis and report to me the progress. So and, and that's gone very well and and we have very little difficulty getting the component CFOs and the senior management staff really wanting to be able to improve financial management in DHS. Yeah, it, it sounds like a, a pretty across the board team effort. Everyone on the same page. Yes, sir. Um, that's great. I'm going to squeeze in um, one other uh, before yielding to my colleagues who, who may have other questions. Um, in talking about the internal controls audit, performance audit, um, is it a fair statement to say that based on your experience at DHS, uh, this approach that was legislated uh, in the Accountability Act uh, is one that uh, we should at least be considering for other departments and agencies, helping them to get to that bedrock you know, um, uh, of good financial management. It's worked very well in the department. It really has, and I think that um, I think many of the other agencies are pr probably more fortunate than I am as far as the number of material weaknesses that, that they have. So hopefully they're able to they're able to do this through their other manage you know for, through FMFIA. Hopefully <laughs> that they've gotten that in there. Um, I do think that for the department though, it's not only been helping us with the internal controls over financial reporting, but it's really become the way way we do life at DHS. Um, the the improvements that we've made in the improvement Proper, in complying with the Improper Payments Act, it's it's just it's about it's about internal controls is really all it is. It's about identifying what your risk areas are, to, you know, really identifying the root causes for making improper payments, establishing strong corrective action plans, monitoring them, and then ultimately doing the right things, such as recovering the money that you may have improperly paid. If you didn't actually improperly pay something, but it was something else, such as a lack of supporting documentation or people didn't sign off that made it an improper payment, you correct that. You correct that issue. And, and so, so for DHS, the, the entire framework of the Accountability Act has really worked very well for us. You, you touched on a specific issue I want to follow up on on, on the uh, improper payments, but uh, let me see if, uh, Mr. Langford, did you have any questions? Or, or? So, yeah. we'll, we'll go to Mr. Towns and then yeah. come back. Okay. You thank to you. the gentleman from New York. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> You know, we talked about the material weaknesses uh, uh, at the Coast Guard. Um, what, what are the weaknesses? They, they have um, they, they contribute to six of the department's overall material weaknesses. Um, the first talks about financial management and reporting. Um, they have a material weakness in internal controls and system functionality. They have one, uh, actually the, the, the only one contributing to our fund balance with Treasury material weakness. Um, they have weaknesses in properly plant and equipment. Um, actuarial and other liabilities, and then in budgetary accounting. Th those are the six remaining material weaknesses at the Department. And because of the pervasive nature of the Coast Guard, they contribute to each of those. Right. You know, does any of this have anything to do with um, turnover of staff in terms of uh, 
not staying? It, at, at the Coast Guard specifically? Yeah, well, Coast Guard and in general. I think um, I think you you touch on a fantastic a fantastic point that we've really been trying to fix at the at, at the department in the last couple of years, and that's really developing core competencies. Um, I do know that the commandant is very interested in doing that, developing core, making sure that you've got those right core competencies, and that the rotation, the the amount of time that you have with people rotating in the Coast Guard, is the right amount of time so that you can actually develop those core competencies. Um, so I think it's less overall a problem at the overall department. And, and frankly, at the Coast Guard, it is no longer really a problem, because what they are doing is, is they are building those core competencies. Um, as a for instance, and what they are doing is they are identifying where their skill gaps are, and then what you are doing is, is you are bringing in the right people at the right time and putting them in the right job. So we saw that both at the Coast Guard just recently, um, you know, and, and then we also saw that at the TSA um, uh, just this past year, what they did is, is they really looked at over overall skill gaps, and then they brought in the right people, um, you know, to be able to address the, the magnitude of the issues that we had. No. You know, I was thinking in terms of um, uh, whether the Department has recorded all of its property and plants and equipment. I mean, how are you doing with that? Because that has been a problem, and, and it's a major. It's clearly it's one of our largest assets, um, and the, the remaining material weakness that we have outside of the Coast Guard on property, plant, and equipment is at is at the TSA, um, and the TSA in 2009 actually had what's called a disclaimer condition, and, and really all the disclaimer condition means is when the auditors come in and take a look at the account balances, they they just simply don't have enough evidence there. So what they what they end up saying basically is I can't tell if this balance is any good. The work that the TSA did during 2008, 2009, uh, 2009 allowed them to actually remove that disclaimer condition in 2010, which basically meant that they, the auditors were able to satisfy them that the amount that we have recorded on the books for TSA property, they were, they were okay with it. They said that it was what is what's called materially correct. Um, having said that, TSA still had some remaining internal control weaknesses, that we, and we do expect to remediate that material material weakness this year at the TSA. And it really starts to become very segmented, because through that strong root cause analysis that they have done, it starts to become segmented to just a couple issues that they are able, such as they may, have, they may do their inventories and they do their reconciliations and they make sure things are recorded correctly. But in TSA's, TSA's case, there were things such as accounting issues, such as recording other, what we call other direct cost. And it just becomes a real narrow slice of what they actually actually needed to fix. So from a, so from a de department-wide perspective, um, we are fixing, we're fixing what we can. Even the Coast Guard has done an awful lot of work at property, plant and equipment, and the uh, property, plant and equipment, and they have done inventories th throughout the entire Coast Guard of their small boats and, and ships and, and um, you know, the, the different pieces of personal property. And what they are doing is, is building what they call assertion packages over property, plant and equipment. The reason why we don't don't have that on our fix this year list is because there's still um, real property that they're still, which is part of that overall line item that they're still working on. So Coast Guard is developing the the, in, the, the internal control processes in order to be able to build those assurance so that I'll be able to get that. Ultimately, I'll be able to take that off as a disclaimer condition as well. Right. I don't want to put you on the spot, but are there any impediments that we should deal with from the from a congressional standpoint? Can I get back to you on that? Okay, right. <laughs> At this point, I can't think of any. Okay, right. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, sir. Thanks, gentlemen. I yield to the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Langford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, for being here. Let me just bounce a couple of things off. Um, you, you had in your list earlier a statement about system security and functionality issues, and listed specifically Coast Guard, FEMA, and ICE on that one. Uh, can we talk a little bit about? We talked a little bit about Coast Guard. Can we talk a little bit about the ICE side of that? What does that mean? Uh, to say that we're dealing with functionality issues and system security. System security means that they have um, uh, typically access controls. The, the, the three controls that we talk about when it comes to system would be access controls, uh, change management controls, and then just in general security controls. So what we do is, as we do, as the auditors do an audit, they'll look through whether or not they've got strong internal controls around those particular areas. 
When it comes to functionality, it is really how well is the system working. So you go beyond just is it a secure system. Right. And, and the main reason the auditors will do that is it allows them to be able to rely on the transactions that are recorded in, 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 in an accounting system um, without having to do so much detail work, without having to pull really large samples and to test them and to do all that. So it is an efficiency thing. But it is also it's the, clearly internal controls or, or IT security is clearly a very critical thing. You need to be able to make sure that you don't have people that have improper access and stuff into right. your system. The so, functionality, oh, I'm sorry. No, just clarifying that. So is our issue a hardware issue based on old equipment, software issue based on just not up to speed on it, or management personnel and process where it's a people issue? Uh, not handling that. I think it's going to be all. It, it typically is. It, it typically is a combination of those. Okay. And 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 what the department has is overall guidance that the, that each of the components need to follow as it relates to, s to system security. And what they need to do is we set those department. I don't do it. The, the CIO's office and the security um, chief security officer does that. They set those standards, and then the components need to meet those. All right. And what it does is it's, it it tells you kind of what the best practices are around access controls. You know, s system security and change management. In some instances, it is because of legacy systems and they are just old and it is right. hard to be able to do it. Uh, so as a, for instance, um, you know, the, the, the length of a password. You know, in order to be able to have a good password, it should be X number of digits in length and you should be able to have special characters, et cetera. Some of the legacy systems, and, and so what the department will do is we will come out and we will say that is the standard. You need to meet the standard. In some instances, if it is a legacy system, you are not going to potentially, maybe, maybe you do not have enough digits in order to be able to do that. So there there will be instances like that. Other times it is a people thing. You know, for instance, um, in, the, in the security manual or in, internal controls best practices, you should have um, background investigations, for instance, of right. the people that have access to, um, to a particular level of data or have the ability to be able to change code. They ought to have a certain level of background investigation. So it is the ability of the, of the component to, that, you know, they have got the ability to be able to do that. But, you know, typically there are some impediments there. So what, what we do as part of the audit is we actually work with them on the IT piece in particular, where it's a, it's a, it's a joint meeting with my office, it's, a, it's the, um, the IG and the, our independent auditor are there, the CIO and the C chief security officer is there of not just the headquarters, but also the components. And what we do is we walk through each one of those and make sure that we have got strong corrective action plans to be able to address them. The functionality piece of it is just really outside of just the security, even though typically impacted by security, right. would be things such as does the system allow duplicate payments? Do you know what I mean? So the, clearly it is a functional issue. You should be able to put, build in controls into your system such that you can prevent a duplicate payment unless you have some sort of a, man, a person override, which you, which you, you, know, you can detect and, and correct. Um, but if the system is in such a, is, is such a, it has a functionality weakness, it may make a, uh, a double payment and you don't know about it until after the fact. It's, it's the, that's the right. distinction between the two. Right. So ultimately at this point, we have hardware, software, and management issues, we may or may not have money that is flowing out of the door that is consistent with what we would hope it would be uh, accomplished, and we are not able to get a good audit yet that is coming. Am, am I picking up a trend here? Well, well no. We, we have what are called compensating controls, all right? So it is, and, and that is the part where it becomes inefficient. You know, what the Accountability Act allows you to be able to do is to identify your root cause. Um, in, in addition to that, the Department has strong risk assessments, so we try to be more forward-leaning, sure. not waiting till a problem happens. But, but um, if, if you identify a, a particular weakness that you can't necessarily build into your system because maybe it is, it's, and I will use the Coast Guard as a, for instance, because maybe the, the way that their system was modified due to change management weaknesses, right. um, you are not actually able to, record in certain instances, actually to get down to an actual transaction level. And clearly you can't necessarily, you can't audit unless you can get to a transaction. Right. But, but, but we have identified that as the root cause, but instead what we put in place are compensating controls, which basically we have to do something other than the most effective and efficient thing we should do in order to be able to correct for that. So we have compensating controls in the, in the, in the case of the duplicate payments. We caught that. Do you know what I mean? Because we have, ideally you want to prevent 
this type of a problem versus detecting the type of a problem, and oftentimes that will have be what your compensating controls end up being. So no, I, I think it just makes we just don't do business as, as as efficiently as we could because of integration. You know, we cut reliance on manual processes and reliance on compensating controls. Um, just the uh, just just the other thing. I'm sorry, I get right. on a roll here. Um, is the um, is the basically the the internal controls. The more of those that you have that are actually part of the system, the, the much more efficient the, the overall agency is going to be. Right. So it makes it seamless. Yes, that, thank yes you. sir. That's exactly right. Yep, thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Um, just a, a final issue I want to touch on, on on improper payments and its recent coverage of uh, FEMA and the payment of, uh, of relief to flood victims and other uh, natural disasters. Um, and then the um, letter in the mail saying, hey, uh, three years ago we paid you $20,000, you know, our mistake, and you got 30 days to pay it back. Um, I, I guess if you can give me an update, because, I mean, this is clearly a, 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 a failure of good internal controls that money was being paid out um, inappropriately, and, and according to some of the, the, the statements in the uh, news coverage of this, where FEMA personnel were kind of, you know, encouraging the individuals to apply, saying, hey, this is something you're entitled to, you, you need to, you know, go after. They get it, they spend it on, you know, uh, home repairs, whatever it may be, and now three years later or more. Can you give us an update? Because I, I know in the, in the article it does reference FEMA, um, you know, in December, the uh, Inspector General being critical of FEMA for not going after hundreds of millions of dollars of improper payments related to Katrina. Uh, and and uh, and several other disasters, and that FEMA's uh, believes it's moved from about 14 percent of um, uh, error rate down to about a three percent error rate. Uh, that's good news. And I guess my two main points, if you can try to address this, one um, is that accurate? Have we have we put in place better controls that we are getting down to a smaller and smaller error rate? Uh, and if so, w what were the main changes that resulted in that? significant change uh, from 14 to 3 percent air rate. Um, and then how are we dealing with the real life impact on these individuals who went through a, a pretty trying circumstances to no uh, wrongfulness on their part, got compensated, have spent that money, and, and now are being asked to, uh, you know, what are we doing to go out of our way to work with these individuals if we are to recoup anything from them? I, I probably can't address the second part of your question, sir, yeah. but we could get back to you with a response if, the, if you'd like on it, just because that's not necessarily within my, my actual area. Yeah. Um, but, the, but the first part of your question is, is directly in my area, and um, you're exactly right. We work very closely with FEMA, in particular as it relates to the, that's improper payments yeah. right there. That's, that's what we're talking about. Example. And And what we've done, in particular as it relates to the individual household payments, is work with them really on the front end process. I mean, the, the, the idea here is to to prevent. You should be preventing right. your improper payments. Even though we are in compliance with the Improper Payment Act, that's really not, I mean, that's great. That's exactly what we need to do. But what we really want to do is to prevent the improper payments in the first place. So what we've done is we've worked, we work with all the components, but in particular FEMA worked on what we call the front end processing errors that they would have. So what they did is instead of, what they did is they tightened up their controls around, um, you know, doing, you know, ch checking for duplicate at people who were applying, you know, for, for two uh, benefits or whatever, making sure that you had valid Social Security numbers, um, you know, things of that nature. So what, in order and for them to have been able to go on from that 7 percent down to the roughly 3 percent error rate, um, they did that really by focusing on some of those front and inter internal controls. Uh, they, they are, um, they are still testing what we, they, they do as part of their annual improper payments um, testing. They test individual household payments. In fact, we, we actually do it quarterly now with them. We make sure that we actually do the testing more real time so that we can make sure that we, we stay really responsive. And what they are finding is just even better results, all right? Mm -hmm. so, so this type of prevention, you know, preventative type <coughs> controls, you know, rather than having to go after people to get money back, um, and, uh, you know, really trying to prevent that up front. So, so that is what we are doing working with them, as well as working with them and their other high-risk programs working through those, those same sort of things. It, it's, uh, I kind of Related to Mr. Connolly's about acquisition personnel and the training that you know up front they're they're doing it right rather than trying to correct it after the fact. 
same here, um, and you may not be able to address this. Uh, this really goes to the, the HR side, of the, the training of the personnel. Um, is there a, 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 a I, I guess, assume that if there's a, a flood in Mississippi or wherever, uh, Iowa, um, that there's a cadre of FEMA personnel who, you know, are well trained and they, this isn't the first time they're doing it. You know, they're, they go out and they know. Um, is it just in that training was not up to up to snuff? That you know that that they were having such a higher error rate, um, you know, or was it because of just the timing of a lot of disasters? And so there wasn't a breakdown in training, but a lot of new personnel. And you may not be able to address that today. I, I, I can address that directly, and I can get back back to, uh, to you on that. But and I was not in the department at that particular right. time. But uh, but I did have the opportunity when I did join the department to work closely with FEMA to examine what those internal control failures were. And what we did is we worked with them for for several years. In fact. <laughs> Um, when we had the hurricanes for Ike and Gustav, what we did is we actually tested those internal controls. And I think it was the IG who tested behind them and came back with saying, yeah, what you're doing as far as tightening these preventative type controls here are working. Um, so, but but, I, but I, I suspect it was probably a combination of many of the things, sir, that you that you talked about. But we can, if you'd like, we could get back yeah, to if, you If that. you could uh, follow up with, with the committee Happy on, uh, on really how, you know, what's the main things they did to get from perhaps double digit to now low single digit uh, error rate. Uh, and then also the other issue I understand outside of your uh, domain is um, how they are working, uh, you know, where an innocent citizen got a payment. Um, and because I understand that there is, you know, the, um, the citizen can, can petition for, you know, to be forgiven or a payment plan. Um, I guess I'd like to know is how um, customer oriented are we because if it is a citizen who's done nothing wrong to get a letter saying I mean even even the initial letter saying hey you owe this money and we'd like it in 30 days if if it was our fault um, yeah, I hope that letter is also laying out um, we'd like you know 30 days understand this may create a financial hardship and so please contact us and you know we will work with you for a repayment I hope we're doing that up front versus a kind of a uh, you know, a letter saying, hey, pay up, um, and then after the fact, we come back. So if, if, we'll if you could you, uh, follow Absolutely. up for the committee, that would be great. Um, uh, no other questions. Um, just want to thank you uh, for, for your testimony here today, but most importantly for your work day in and day out, and, uh, and really you getting your arms around um, uh, a very important assignment because uh, the more efficient and um, well-managed department is, the more effective it's going to be in serving our nation and in, in, in a lot of critically important missions. Uh, also thank your staff that are with you as well as who work uh, day in and day out with you at the department. Uh, we, we certainly want to be a partner for you. And kind of goes to Mr. Towns, I think his last question, uh, if you do have something to, to put on our list of that, what we can do to better assist, because that's what we want to do. We want to uh, partner with you, assist in any way we can. If there's um, something legislatively that you need, um, we, we stand ready to work with you and, and your um, colleagues to try to make that happen to allow you to be as effective as possible. So, Thank you, sir. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, Thank you. you. Uh, you're welcome. And uh, we'll keep the record open for two weeks for, for any additional information. Uh, otherwise, uh, this hearing stands adjourned.